Good morning and welcome to Dungeness Community Church. If you are visiting with us this week in person or online, we would love to get to know you better. For our online guests, you can text the word hello to 360-683-7333 or click the connect button on our website. In-person guests can fill out a welcome card located at the back of the auditorium on our offering boxes. Tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., we will be hosting another free movie night in the chapel. Our movie this month will be Free Burma Rangers, the true story of a remarkable family compelled by Christ to bring hope to the front lines of war. Viewer discretion is advised for intense graphic sequences of war violence. This Mother's Day, DCC is doing things a little differently than we have in the past. For some women, Mother's Day can be a difficult holiday for a variety of reasons. This year, we would like to honor all mothers through supporting our local Obria Center here in Squim. If you would like to give a donation of any amount to Obria in honor of a special woman in your life, we will have a table set up in the foyer to collect donations. Join Pastor Tim on YouTube every Thursday for the weekly update anytime after 6 a.m. to keep you apprised of what is happening here at DCC. And now, let's join the worship team to praise our Sovereign Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the good Breath that I 
power of your love that changes us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood Hey, DCC Kids, Pastor Britt here to tell you about today's Go Plus lesson. One of the earliest followers of Jesus was a man named Joseph, only nobody called him that. He was always building others up, so his friends nicknamed him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Isn't that a great nickname to have? When others were in need, Barnabas gave generously. When others were struggling, Barnabas jumped in to help them. When they were feeling discouraged, Barnabas was ready with an encouraging word. The church needed and still needs men and women and girls and boys like Barnabas. The big idea for today's lesson is God wants us to build his church by encouraging others. And the memory verse is, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.11. God calls us to be encouragers, to build one another up. Who can you encourage this week? Through generosity, through help, or just through a kind word? If you can't think of anyone, ask God to open your eyes to opportunities to carry on Barnabas' legacy of encouragement. Whether you're at home with your family or with us at church today, I hope you enjoy the lesson. Talk to you next week. You know, watching little kids learn how to communicate always intrigues and amazes me. I mean, these new little people enter the world without any concept of how language works, but within a matter of two or three years, usually have assembled a good working vocabulary. Now, that's not to say toddlers and even older children have mastered all the nuances of language. Adults often say things that we really mean, but we also don't really mean, which can result in pretty amusing misunderstandings. I ran across a website recently with pictures that parents had sent in showing instances where their little ones uh, took things a little too literally. For instance, one mother had asked her son to put a jar of water into the dog's bowl. This is what she found. Well, it is a jar of water in the dog bowl. Another family had gotten a new puppy and their young son, eager to train the puppy, 
asked how he could do it. And mom told him that he could look up some puppy training videos on YouTube. And he did, just like she told him, and got busy training the new puppy. Or how about the busy mom that asked her eager to help two-year-old to clean off the table while she was doing dishes? This is what she came back to. Well, and finally, this one from a seven-year-old and his attempt to solve some of the new math. Uh, the question on the test was this. Find the difference between eight and six. Do you know the answer? Well, the answer is eight is all curly, six is not. You know, we all understand that sometimes taking what others say too literally actually means that we totally missed the point. That's an important reminder as we come to this next section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We're going to hear Jesus say some pretty extreme things, things which, taken to their most literal meaning, would totally miss the point. At the same time, Jesus intentionally used extreme language because he was trying to disrupt some extremely misguided ways of thinking. Here's the problem. We are really good at self-justification, rationalization, and evasion. Uh, here are a couple more kid picks that I think make the point. Uh, one is a young man who apparently had gotten himself in trouble. Uh, he apparently was told that he was not to set foot outside of the house. He complied with that command. Or how about uh, this kid whose mom told him that it was too nice of a day to stay indoors playing computer games and that he needed to go outside. This is what she saw through the window. Yep, perfect obedience. You know, it's not just kids that do stuff like that. We adults are really good at figuring out creative ways to work around the rules. You may recall that a bit earlier in this sermon, Jesus rebutted a charge being made against him that he was trying to get rid of the Old Testament laws. He answered that he was not trying to get rid of them, but to fully fulfill them. The fact was the religious leaders who made that charge were themselves the ones who had come up with ingenious ways to keep the law while really breaking the law. They not only had found a way to justify their own misdeeds, they had also taught it to others. And over time, those rationalizations and justifications had become entrenched and solidified in the minds and the hearts of the people of Israel. They had become hard-hearted to what God truly desired. And so Jesus approaches a hard-hearted culture with a call to repent and knowing how calcified their hearts have become, he really comes in with a sledgehammer. He pounds away with extreme images that were designed to be jarring, to get their attention and crack through the hard shells surrounding their hearts. Last week, we considered the sledgehammer words he had for angry people. He actually equated it with murder. This week, he's going to go after another topic that probably most of his audience figured didn't apply to them, but by the time he's done, is probably going to make a bunch of people squirm. He's going to talk about adultery. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. 
You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, of course they had heard that. He was quoting right out of the Ten Commandments. Actually, commandment number seven, to be specific. And that one is pretty simple to understand. Don't have sex with another person's spouse. But he doesn't stop there. He pulls in commandment number nine as well. Uh, Exodus 20:17 says this, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, coveting your neighbor's wife is not the same as committing adultery with her. One is the physical act. The other is the mental desire. You may get caught in the act, but the coveting, well, that's something that's easily hidden. Of course, it's easy to treat coveting as a little less serious. Even the commandment about coveting sort of blends in lust for another man's wife with a bunch of other things you might wish were yours. Everything from his house to his livestock or really anything that he has that you want. I mean, sure, it's probably not good, but hey, we all look over the fence from time to time. It's not that big of a deal. Well, Jesus would beg to differ. He thinks that casual attitude is actually a sign of a hard heart. So, out comes the sledgehammer. If you're looking to lust, well, you're already an adulterer. You know what the law of Moses prescribed for those caught in adultery? Capital punishment. So when Jesus made that charge to his audience, that was probably largely a group of testosterone-fueled males. He had their attention. Let's take just a moment here to consider what Jesus was warning about and what he wasn't. What he doesn't say is that any time a man looks at a woman, he has committed adultery. God made men and he made women. He gave each of us our forms and he has wired us in such a way that we find the other attractive. For a guy, seeing a pretty girl and appreciating her prettiness, or for a woman noticing a handsome man and, and noting that, that is not sin. Feeling pleasure or attraction is not sin. Sin is when we take right desires and let them lead us outside the boundaries of other honoring love. Note that Jesus is talking about a man who looks at a woman with lustful intent. It's not just attraction in passing. It is a look with intent. And the intent is to fuel an appetite. And with that as the intent, the motivation behind the look, the, the woman ceases to be a person and becomes merely an object. As a man looking at a pretty woman becomes sin when I cease to see her and honor her as a complete person. It's sin when I reduce her to a sexual object and begin in my imagination to seduce or use and abuse that object for my own gratification. Along with ceasing to honor her, I also cease to honor those who are in relationship with her as a wife, a daughter, a mother, a friend. That imaginary seduction, use, and abuse left unchecked will give rise to plotting ways to make the imagined become real. Taken far enough, the day may come that you cross over not just the imaginary boundary, but the physical boundary as well. That is what Jesus is talking about when he speaks of looking at a woman with lustful intent. The ancient church father, Chrysostom, referred to it as kindling the furnace within. Now, I think it is fair to say that most of the men listening to Jesus weren't feeling comfortable at this point. Jesus is doing at least two big things in this sermon. 
First, he's calling his followers to repent of living a thin, surface kind of righteousness. He wants them to be right in their hearts, not just their actions. Second, he's leading them into deep water where they will soon realize they cannot on their own stay afloat. He wants them to see their own spiritual poverty. And in seeing that, he's preparing them for the revelation that he alone is their savior. At this point, they have no clear understanding of how much they need a savior on a cross. But as they grapple with what true righteousness looks like, it's going to become more and more clear that just trying harder won't work. Right now though, they are still in the mode of, okay, how do I fix it? And Jesus has a shocking answer, Matthew 5, 29 and 30. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And then he follows up with something just as shocking. He says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. So here are a couple of those extreme sledgehammer statements Jesus made that were designed to get attention, but not to be literally carried out. It's called hyperbole, an exaggerated statement that is not meant to be taken literally. Jesus has already made the point that adultery begins with coveting in the heart. But he doesn't recommend tearing out your heart, or more literally, your brain, where imaginations reside. And when it comes to tearing out an eye, blind people are just as capable of lust and adultery as are folks with two good eyes. So obviously removing an eye really doesn't remove the problem. Or removing your hand. Uh, double amputees are just as capable of lust and sexual sin as people that have all of their limbs. So what is he trying to say with such graphic imagery? And does this have anything to say to those of us, like me, who are left-handed? Since he only talked about getting rid of your right hand. Well, in the ancient world, the right side was seen as the side of strength and honor and power, which was understandable since most people are right-handed. It is the hand that holds the sword and the scepter. To be seated on the right side of a king was to be given the number two position of power in the kingdom. Similarly, the right eye came to symbolize power and authority. You can see this imagery in the Old Testament prophet Zechariah's words in Zechariah 11:17. He says, "Woe to the worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. May his arm be completely withered, his right eye totally blinded." So Jesus is saying that this issue of moral purity and heart is serious enough to warrant the strongest of effort to bring it under control. I like how John Stott talks about it. He says, To obey this command of Jesus will involve, for many of us, a certain maiming. We shall have to eliminate from our lives certain things which, though some may be innocent in themselves, either are or could easily become sources of temptation. In the ESV, the English Standard Version, it says, if your right eye causes you to sin. The New International Version translates it a little bit differently. It says, if your right eye causes you to stumble. Uh, that Greek word has the idea of being tripped up. Getting tripped up does a few things. First, it slows us up. Second, tripping tends to take us off the trail. And third, if we don't catch ourselves, we will end up flat on our face. I remember once backpacking as a teen, and my pack had a shoulder strap that was fraying 
but I wasn't paying attention to it. And suddenly, while I was pushing up a pretty steep section of the trail, that strap broke and gave way. And the pack, seemingly without warning, swung off to one side, and before I knew what had happened, I was off the trail and laying on my back in the brush. I've watched people have the same thing happen in their walk of faith. Something was fraying, but they weren't paying attention. They didn't want to stop and deal with the problem. But suddenly the day came that everything broke loose, and seemingly out of nowhere, they just went careening off the path, and their moral life ended up in a smoldering pile. Jesus tells his disciples that strong action is warranted because the consequences for going off the trail are serious. In fact, really serious. He says that failure to deal now with moral sin sets us up for eternal judgment later. And I don't think he was using hyperbole when he talked about that. The cross is evidence that God saw a need to take drastic action to save us. I've literally seen people turn away from the cross because their hearts and lives became so consumed by their sexual lusts. And the wreckage is tragic. No wonder Jesus addressed it in the strongest of terms. So what do we do if sexual temptation is dogging our steps? threatening to trip us up? Well, the first thing I would say is that we need to name it. We need to call it for what it is. It's sin. That's where Jesus started. He took something he knew his students had found a way to rationalize away, and he made them see it for what it was. If we use Chrysostom's image of lust being the kindling of the furnace within, then we should ask ourselves, where is the fuel coming from that I'm feeding into the furnace? It's a no-brainer to say that the internet is like a river of gasoline when it comes to its potential to feed the furnace of lust. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that some of you, men and women, who are listening to me are caught in its flood. You may have even given up on thinking you could ever get out. Or worse, maybe you've actually found a way to make peace with it. You've come up with some rationalization that it's not really all that bad. For others, it may not be the internet per se, but the movies you let yourself consume keep feeding a steady diet of plot lines and images that linger and fester long after the end credits have rolled. Some get caught up in romantic fantasy Novels that may not have photographs, but the seductive storylines fuel imaginations that you would be ashamed to have revealed. It may be a real relationship that you have begun to view inappropriately. It's a friend or a coworker or a neighbor that your mind keeps obsessing over inappropriately. Maybe it's not just fantasy. Maybe you're crossing the line in a physical relationship with someone else. You know it's not right. But the longer it goes, the more impossible it seems to think of getting free. Here's part of the lie. The lie is, it's just sex. No, it's not. It's part of your personhood. Never cheapen it by saying, it's just sex. Sex has been wired by God in such a way that it powerfully connects us, emotionally and spiritually, with another person. Placed in its rightful, God-ordained place within a committed marriage, it gives expression to the beautiful oneness of husband and wife. To reduce it to just a physical sensation between two willing bodies is to damage our souls. It demands forming calluses where there should be tenderness. It requires holding parts of ourselves in reserve in the very act that should consummate complete trust and commitment. 
It means compromising long-term needs for momentary pleasure. I fully understand that there are destructive marital relationships where sex has become a painful, even abusive thing. That too is sin. The failure to use what God created and blessed to act with true love toward our partner. But taking sex outside the boundaries only adds failure and pain. So whether the sin is hidden in our heart or being pursued between the covers, the first thing we have to do is unflinchingly label it for what it is. A selfish act using another for my pleasure. It is sin. Once we've identified it, then we need to act on it. We need to take strong action. Jesus used dramatic, over-the-top words to make his point. He took a sledgehammer to it. We should too. Part of that will mean accountability. That begins with prayer. At the outset, Jesus proclaimed blessing on those who were poor in spirit and who mourned. That was all in the context of repentance. God knows your struggle. He's not surprised. He still loves you. What he wants is for you to openly acknowledge your need to him. Those are cleansing tears. You have a father who is ready and willing to forgive and to restore. But I think you also need to bring one or two others into the process. Hidden sins are rarely overcome with hidden solutions. Probably all of us who have ever tried dieting on our own can attest that when we're the only ones who know the goal, well, it's way too easy to cheat and quit. The enemy of our souls is a master at using secret sins to keep us defeated with internal shame and self-loathing. If you're caught up in any kind of habitual, lust-oriented sin, you need to find someone who is spiritually mature and make yourself accountable. Is that easy to do? Nope. But probably a little easier than gouging out your eye. Maybe you need to start by sitting down with a counselor or a pastor. Another option may be a group that we have here at the church called Celebrate Recovery. It's a group of folks who have admitted to themselves and each other that there are hurts and hang-ups that have gotten the upper hand, and they're committed to helping each other walk rightly. Something else that will need to happen is strong, decisive action to stop fueling the furnace. You may need to walk away from a relationship. If there's a neighbor or coworker or a friend that you're becoming emotionally or physically involved with, get out of the relationship. You may need to change your viewing habits. I've known a few guys who actually cut their internet, which in 2021 is right up there with cutting off your right arm. You may need to install filtering software or set some rules with your spouse or a friend about where or when you'll be on the computer or your smartphone. There may be books you need to quit reading, movies you need to quit watching. I know that simply turning off the screen or closing the book won't eliminate all the struggles in the mind, but it's going to be pretty hard to quench the fire if you keep feeding it more and more fuel. Here's one practical step that I've talked about before that many have found helpful, and that is spend more time fantasizing. Now I know that sounds backwards, but let me explain. In a sense, this is what Jesus was encouraging his disciples to do when he asked them to imagine a future of facing God's judgment. He was asking them to picture something beyond the immediate alluring fantasy of lust that they were tempted with. He was asking them to picture where it would take them long term. So here's what I would suggest as an in-between step. If your mind is beginning to toy with a wrong fantasy, 
Make yourself play the fantasy out. But don't just stop with the short-term, sexy, exciting part. No, play out all of the parts. Fantasize about your spouse, your parents, your kids, your friends, finding out about the affair. Fantasize about that other person's spouse, parents, kids, friends, finding out. Fantasize about the conversations that you'll have with each of those people. Fantasize about the legal proceedings if your affair leads to divorce. Spend some time mentally spreadsheeting what it will cost in attorney fees, what you'll lose when the estate is divided, what Christmas will look like for family gatherings. If you're going to have a fantasy, make sure you don't leave out any details because as sure as an affair of the heart can lead to an affair in a bed, so too that affair in the heart will lead to more heartache than you ever wanted and ultimately you will answer to God. Living like mountain folk sometimes means some steep climbing. It can be hard work. It may mean some tough sacrifices. It may mean dropping some stuff out of your pack. But finding freedom is so worth it to you, to those you love, and to the Lord that we follow. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Well, hello. So, I think we all know what lust is. It's a strong craving or desire, often of a sexual nature. Although, we can also lust over things, such as riches or power. Though used relatively infrequently, 29 times in Scripture, it's a common theme that runs throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, the word is primarily used to describe idolatrous activities. 
The term lust is used to display an idolatrous relationship, primarily Israel's desire to be like her surrounding neighbors. But in the New Testament, the word moves from referring primarily to idolatry to referring instead almost exclusively to sexual immorality. While the idea of idolatry is not completely absent, the primary intention is as a strong, inordinate desire for sexual relations. Our lusts have a very powerful influence on our actions if they are not caught and corrected immediately. It does, however, have a great potential becoming an action. That is why we must heed the admonition of Paul in 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So the warning is to stop the lust before it moves into the realm of action. So today we heard Jesus' words to his Jewish audience, but I thought it would be good to see what the apostles wrote to the early church concerning lust. So below, and these are our questions for discussion and consideration, Below, I have included several scriptures where Paul, Peter, and John speak about lust. Take a few minutes and look up some or all of these scriptures and discuss those spirit-inspired words of God. I'm not going to talk you through them all. I'm just going to list them on the screen in front of you. Also, below, as sort of a bonus feature, I've included some references in the Old Testament to the word lust. So I hope this is a good time for you. I hope you just get a good feel for uh, how God feels about this. I think we know, but it's always good to have reminders. So thank you and have a great day.